Okay. All right, we have 33 people who've responded to the poll so far. Any any other takers? So I'll release the results in a sec. I'll just leave it there for a bit longer, but we've got mostly SPSS users, R users and Python users, and only a couple of people who've tried ChatGPT4 or ChatGPT, which is good. And we've got a few others. Yep. So we've got quite a different, different um, number of responses there. Okay, all right. Well, I might end that in the interest of time. We'll get started. Okay, so that's just hopefully showing the results there. And I'll stop sharing that now. Okay, so welcome to our data and decision science network meeting. So what we're going to be doing today is just Brad and I will give you a quick introduction about our backgrounds and why we're doing uh, this presentation. And I'll talk briefly about our UOW data and decision science network and then we'll get into the chat GPT component. So I'll be talking about chat GPT-4 and the advanced data analysis plugin. So since I advertised this meeting, it's already changed its name from being the code interpreter to the advanced data analysis plugin. And Brad's then going to, to cover some chat GPT-3 um, capacity and we'll explain why as we go along. Why we're doing the two options. Okay, so first of all, we'll do an acknowledgement to country. We'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. We would like to pay our respects to the elders past, present, and would like to extend our respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and students who are present today. Okay, so my name's Marika Batterham. I'm the coordinator of the Data and Decision Science Initiative here at UOW. I'm also the director of the National Institute of the Applied Statistics Research Australia and our Stats Consulting Centre here. Now, I'm really passionate about data literacy. I love talking about data and how you can interpret data and the difference that understanding data can make to your research and to everyday living. I mostly use RStudio and SPSS, and my absolute favorite analysis is logistic regression, which we might be looking at briefly today, but mostly my bread and butter is using mixed models, and I love learning new packages and learning about machine learning. So Brad, are you there? Okay, I'm not quite sure where Brad is, but we'll just keep going. Okay. So our data and decision science initiative is part of our strategic plan and it developed from a report back in 2019 which identified that UOW needed to um, step up its game in terms of data science and so the initiative commenced in July 2021 and it's led by NIASRA. So there are four key components of the initiative and the data and decision science network is one of them. And that's where we provide themed meetings, which is what we're holding today. We also have two education components, particularly focusing on training our early career researchers, staff and research students to make them uh, more data literate and improve their data science skills. But we also have a real focus on our undergraduate subjects as well, so that we can try and improve data literacy across the continuum of our education spectrum here at UOW. And we also have an external and industry engagement component. So I'm not going to talk a lot about what ChatGPT is or any of the technical background about ChatGPT. We really want to talk about using ChatGPT and how you can make it work for you. But just to say that it's based on a on neural networks, which which have actually been around since the 1950s, but the game really stepped up when the transformer models were developed. 
in 2017 by Google researchers. And since then, ChatGPT has been launched. It launched last year. And the growth and capacity in ChatGPT is increasing very rapidly. So ChatGPT4 was only launched in July. It's bigger and has more parameters than ChatGPT3. So it's more accurate, basically. The training data set, however, is still the initial one, which closed off in September 2021. And hopefully that will be updated at some stage. So it's it's not the only one. Um, and the large language model that ChatGPT uses, you can also access in Bing. And also there are other large language models. So for example, Code Llama. Um, Code Llama at the moment, I've had a bit of a play with it, but it doesn't integrate R code, so it's not something that will work for me at the moment, but it does a lot of other codes. And really, I'd say just to finish off that bit is just stay tuned. This is just the beginning. These models are developing really rapidly at the moment, and so the capacity and scope is only going to increase. So I'll just let Brad say hello quickly um, before we get going. So hi. Brad, hi. Sorry, I, I had a, another link that didn't work, so... Um... Oh. <laughs> Sorry, okay, that was, it was my fault. Sorry about that. But um, I'm Brad. I'm a statistical consultant in the consulting center. Um, and I'm here to help talk about uh, ChatGPT. Cool. Okay. All right. So I'll get started with the ChatGTP4 component. So the way that you can analyze, actually analyze data sets in ChatGPT is only possible in ChatGPT4 at the moment. And it's through a plugin, which is called the Advanced Data Analysis Plugin. So plugins, there are lots of them and the number's growing every day. It's an add-on to ChatGPT, which augments some sort of specific functionality. For example, there's one for Expedia, which is able to answer travel questions in real time. There are several other ones that are really useful um, because they're just coming on board. I haven't had a lot of time to explore them but there is actually one where you can access the internet. And there's also a really useful one where you can upload PDF documents, which will come in handy in terms of research because you can get ChatGPT to summarize PDFs potentially of research papers, for example. And there's also a really nice one that creates flow charts and diagrams as well, which might be useful for research. So the advanced data analysis plugin allows you to upload visualize as an analyzed data and also to help and be able to solve mathematical problems. Now, ChatGPT 3 and 3.5 are not very good at actually doing maths. They just use the large language models to predict what the outcome might be, not actually do the calculations, whereas ChatGPT 4 does do, let you do that. One caveat at the moment is that you have to pay. It's only available in ChatGPT Plus, but I think that'll change over time, particularly with other large language models coming on board, it's likely there are going to be free ways to do this in the very near future. It's also important to note that it codes in Python. Okay, so you can upload files of many different types, and this is a new capacity to ChatGPT. You haven't been able to do this before. So it can upload a number of different file types. In terms of other code files, though, I have tried to upload SPSS to it and it struggled. It tried a number of different Python package packages and wasn't able to do it. I mean, of course, you can transfer that into a different file type, but just to say it's not perfect at the moment in the number and range of files that it can upload. And you can also upload images, but it can't really produce images. It can edit them, and we'll have a quick look at that in terms of research as we go through as well. So some of the real pros of ChatGPT4 is that if you're not an expert on data analysis and you don't know exactly what statistical test or analytical method you might need to perform on your data, then ChatGPT can give you cues and ask questions about your data and help you find an appropriate analysis to do. Now, I say appropriate with some hesitation because it doesn't always get things right, which is one of the caveats we'll discuss as well. It does explain the output, which is really useful. So if there's a new method that you haven't learned about before, 
you can think of it as sort of a coach or a tutor sitting with you because it does give you explanations and you can prompt it to ask what think particular things need. So even though it codes in Python, it can, it can transfer the code to code for a number of different packages very successfully for R and SPSS, for example, I've tried and also starter and I'll show you some of that as well. It can do file conversions and it can write data analysis reports. And you can save all of the syntax for reproducibility. However, the chat updates and it runs, it, it times out. So you can't actually uh, save the exact chat. So there are some cons here, and there's a really big caveat that I need to mention up front. So at the moment, even though the, uh, the chat GPT-4 does the data analysis in what's called a sand pit, so it's siloed off, there is a potential that your data could be hacked. And essentially, I think you have to think of it as uploading something to Facebook. So we cannot be 100% confident at the moment that your data is safe in there. So basically, you should not be uploading any confidential or identifiable data to analyze in chat GPT-4 at the moment. And UOW, for example, has guidelines on generative AI and research, and it explicitly states that the following data set should not be provided to generative AI, and they include um, human research data. So you can disable your chat history. And in that case, the data and the chat history is only stored for 30 days. And that's a really a safety factor um, because these models are particularly, or the companies that own them are particularly concerned about um, adversarial prompts. And we'll talk about that briefly in a minute as well. But don't despair because I think the future, this is just the beginning. And in the future, there will be environments, I'm certain, where we can do actual data analysis in here. And also you can simulate data sets. You can get ChatGPT4 to simulate a data set for you or download a similar data set so that you can practice the data analysis and export the code to analyze on your real data. So there are several limitations to ChatGPT4. So I think one of the main ones from a data analysis point of view is that it is still relying on that 2021 data set. So particularly if you work in R, like I do, um, then a lot of the, the R packages have changed a lot since 2021. And so sometimes the packages that ChatGPT4 suggests are deprecated or they're not working anymore. So it means that it, it your R code has a few bugs in it that you need to fix. So it does report errors, but it doesn't help with debugging, like um, say using RStudio would. It also still makes a lot of mistakes. So for example, in a report that I was writing relating to the data set that we're looking at here, it kept finishing the conclusion with a sentence half finished. It can also become stuck um, and unable to find a solution, particularly when you're trying to work with other formats. And at the moment, it can't generate a fully referenced scientific report. But as I mentioned, those plugins, are, there are more coming on a daily basis. So I think it's only a matter of time before you can generate a nice fully um, referenced report. So just some terminology that we need to go over quickly before we launch into having a look at it. So prompt engineering, that's developing and optimizing large language model prompts. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. I mentioned adversarial prompts before. Now these are prompts that are designed to confuse the model and override safety features. So I'm sure you're all aware that ChatGPT has safety features so you can't ask about, um, about dangerous things like, for example, building a bomb or um, killing people and committing suicide and those sort of things. But people love trying to find a way around it. So adversarial prompts are a way that people try and do that. So the first example given there is how people may try and work out how to build a bomb by asking ChatGPT to write a poem and trick it that way. There's also a paper that just came out recently um, specifically looking at those adversarial prompts to write a bomb. And they have one here where you're confusing ChatGPT by giving it nonsensical text after non nonsensical text after asking um, it how to write the tutorial. 
Now, hallucinations are still really common, and that's when you get output that's factually incorrect, but it sounds really plausible. And there's an example there where um, someone's asked it when Leonardo da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa, and it gives a very definitive answer, but it's not a correct answer. Now, that happens to me um, just yesterday when I was preparing for this. I was looking at some data that was clearly normally distributed and ChatGPT4 was telling me that it wasn't normally distributed. So at the moment, you do still have to be careful and interpret it and be careful and have a look at everything and go over it. Now, a lot of people are worried about losing their jobs to AI. Uh, something that you might want to think about doing then is becoming a prompt engineer because at the moment, uh, it's a very in-demand profession and you can earn a lot of money. So what is it? And why is it important for this? So prompt engineering are the, the prompts or the input text that you actually give to generate the models. Now, they're really important because the way you, you generate your prompt can have a really big impact on the output. So companies that build large language models hire prompt engineers to actually improve the development of the model but also other companies employ prompt engineers to be able to use AI to make use of the uh, generative technology and to develop actual documents. But for us as researchers, good prompt engineering is really important because it saves time and makes the output what's required. So one way of thinking about it is that your chat GPT-4 is your new junior intern or a postdoc or a new PhD student. So they've got a basic skill set, but it's important to check and fine tune and rework and finish off on the documents. And you cannot guarantee everything is correct. If someone's just started a job, they might need some help with things. And one tip is to ask ChatGPT for that it understands what you think by repeating what you've just asked us to do. And also um, one way, particularly with ChatGPT4, they worked very hard to look at steerability, which is where you tell ChatGPT what role it's playing and that way it can flavor the output in terms of what you want it to give you. So for example, if you do it as a data analyst or a clinical researcher, then it's going to tone the responses in that way. So let's have a quick look at ChatGPT4. Now it runs really slowly. So what I'm going to show you uh, is some document that of, uh, or some an output that I've already generated and we'll try and do a live run as well. So I will just stop sharing this. What we're going to do is uh, do some exploratory data analysis on the data set and then ask it to perform a test and have a look at the output. And then we'll have a look at a machine learning um, output as well and how to work with other packages and images and figures. So the data set that we're going to have a look at, there's just a few lines of it shown here. So it's simulated from a famous data set, a Pima Indians data set that's used a lot in machine learning. And we're particularly going to be having a look at uh, the BMI variable and the diabetes variable. So, let me just end that show and get our chat GPT output here. So you can see that it's timed out. So I'm not going to be running this live, but this is just to go through it. As I said, it, it just takes too long to run this live when you're on Zoom. So the first thing we do is that we upload the data set and that's by just clicking on this button here, the attach files button. I'm assuming you can all see this okay, Brad? Can you see my, yep, cool. Okay, and so then I just uploaded it and pressed enter. And it says that it sees that I've uploaded a file and it wants to know how it can assist me. So my first prompt is to describe the data set and perform an exploratory data analysis. So it really nicely explains to you what it's going to do. So as a data advocate, and a statistician, I'm emphasizing here that we always, always, always start off by performing an exploratory data analysis and having a look at the data. So ChatGPT4 is very good at this. It goes through a fairly thorough overview 
and it provides some summary statistics. It looks for missing values. It looks at the data distributions, and it's also going to perform a correlation. So it goes ahead to do this, and it, you can show the working here. So this is the Python code that's generating the output. So it tells you the variables the data set contains, and I haven't told it anything about these data sets. So all that's in the file are these headings here, and ChatGPT4 is guessing what these are. Now, in this case, it's probably because this data set is a machine learning data set that's fairly famous. So it can predict, because it's a large language model, what these variables are. But even still, given the variable titles like GLUC or BP or age or diabetes, then it, it can work out to some extent what these variables are. It may not always get it right, but it does try and do it. So then it goes through some summary statistics, which is really helpful. And we would look at these to look as look for what we would normally look for so that the counts are correct, that the minimums and maximums are what we'd expect. And so it just quickly goes through these for all of the values. It looks to see if there are any missing values and it tells you that there are none. And it says it's great, which is great because then we don't have to do it to worry about that. So now it plots the distributions, which is really nice. So it shows us histograms of all of the variables. Again, with the we can have a look at the Python code here, which we could copy out if we wanted to rerun this, or we could get ChatGPT4 to export that code as SPSS syntax or R syntax. So not only does it produce the histograms, but it also goes on to give a brief description of all of them and tell you whether they're skewed or whether they're approximately normally distributed. So that's really helpful. So then it's going to do a correlation matrix and here it makes a mistake. So the good thing is that it, when, it, when it makes a mistake, it tries to fix it. Now in this case, luckily it did because often it can't fix it and sometimes it just times out and gets stuck. But here it just says it forgot to it forgot to import a particular library and it's then found some other way to do it. And then we get a correlation matrix here between all of our variables. So this is a heat map and the darker the color, the stronger the correlation between the various variables. So that's a really nice visualization there. And again, if you don't understand how to interpret that, it gives you a nice, um, nice, piece of information here about all of those correlations. It explains the correlations between the variables. And then it summarizes that. So then it gets to the end of that and asks if there are any specific analyses or tasks that it would like you to do. So here's my next prompt. So it's gone ahead and done all of that just by me asking it to describe the data and do an exploratory data analysis. So then I'd like it to perform a test to determine if there's any difference between BMI, between those with and without diabetes, and to make sure it checks the assumptions of the test. So it tells you what the assumptions are, and it tells you how to do it. So it then goes through checking the assumptions. So first of all, it checks the normality assumption for both groups separately, and then it interprets that. Then it goes on to check the homogeneity of variance assumption and interprets that as well. And then it performs an independent samples t-test and it interprets the results there. So then it wants to know if there's anything else we'd like it to do. So what if we ask it to write a report and to include a visualization? So then it goes on to write a report and it gives some background about diabetes it goes through the methods, tells you what assumptions it's checked, gives you the results, visualizes the data, writes a discussion. And I didn't ask it for this, but it's also gone on to give you limitations and future directions and a conclusion. And then it'd be very useful because it's not going to change uh, to save this chat history and um, I could copy and paste it, but then it's not formatted very well. So I want it to create a Word document of the report, including the image and to download it. So it then goes ahead and does that. 
and it gives you a link to output the file. And I'll show you that in a minute, but I also want to have it saved as an ARM markdown document. So it does that as well. So that means I've got the code there to rerun it. And I also want all of the code outputted so that I can redo that again. It has a little bit of trouble doing that. And the bit that it has trouble doing is actually transferring the R code. Okay, so we'll just quickly show you the report. So this is the report that it comes out with. So you can see it's a nice Word document with headings. It's got the figure in there and the discussion. The limitations in the future direction and conclusions didn't format properly, but that's something that you could easily fix. So then the next thing that I'm going to talk about really quickly is doing machine learning. So if you just want to have a go at doing machine learning, ChatGPT4 can do that as well. So I'll just really quickly show you the code for that one. And this could be if you're a clinician and you wanted to um, develop a prediction model for predicting diabetes and you wanted to output this, to what we call a shiny app in R, so an app that could actually predict it, then you can do it. So I'm not going to go into detail about this. I've just got to get to where it starts. Okay, so I want to just talk about our data set. Okay, so I've said to ChatGPT4, if I upload some data, can you perform machine learning analysis for the classification and develop a shiny app for prediction with, of, with future diabetes? So it goes through what it, how, what it will do to do that, and it goes through the processes. So again, it uploads the data, says there are no missing values. It splits it into a training and testing data set, and then it starts by wanting to do a random forest. So we do a random forest. It gives you the output and it explains how to interpret it. And then it asks if I'd like to try another algorithm. So I do that and it does a logistic regression. And then we try another algorithm as well. So it does a support vector classifier. And it asks if I want to try any others. So I try gradient boosting. So it's done all of those. It compares the four different types of machine learning models and it decides the logistic regressions the best and asks if we want to develop the Shiny app with that. So I ask it to go ahead and do that. And so it does it using the logistic regression model. There's all the output there, which can be saved and it downloads that and it explains how to actually um, run the Shiny model in there, the Shiny app in there. So it's developed this prediction model, and this is the Shiny app here. And what we can do with this Shiny app is that a new person comes along and we can program in their particular values. So we give their glucose level, blood pressure, their skin thickness. So these are all of the variables that's used in the model. Age, BMI, and then we click predict. And then it will say here, the predicted outcome is no diabetes. So we can change all of these and this would be a way that you could use this in a predictive sense. Okay. So I think that's a very exciting development. So if you've never done machine learning before and you think that's something that appeals to you, then you can do that in ChatGPT. So what if you use SPSS or Starter? The first thing you can do is on the right here, you could provide, ask it to provide detailed descriptions on how you could do the exploratory analysis and how to perform the t-test. And it will give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that in SPSS. Or you could ask it to import the syntax for doing that analysis directly. And then you could run that syntax in SPSS. So there are two ways that you could do it, depending on whether you'd prefer to use the pull-down menus 
or whether you want to work with the syntax, which would be better for reproducibility. You can do a similar thing for starter. You can ask starter to do it using the pull down menu options, or you can ask it to provide the starter code for doing those tests as well. So the last thing I'm going to talk about quickly is using images. So it's often the case that perhaps someone gave you a particularly an SPSS chart that they, they can no longer recreate and they want it redone for publication, for example. So say we had this figure from SPSS here on the left, and you can see that the BMI is reported to lots of decimal places, which are all zero. So that kind of makes you, the figure not look very good and certainly not ready for publication. So you can get ChatGPT4 to edit the y-axis to have one decimal place and to be larger. Now, I must say this took quite a lot of time to do. So it took several iterations. So first of all, it was too big and then it was too small. And so it took quite a bit of fidgeting to get that right, which is why I haven't fixed up the whole figure because it needs other editing as well. So you probably change the labels down here. But you can certainly do it in ChatGPT4. It's just a bit time consuming. What's probably more useful is that you could upload this image to ChatGPT4 and then say to ChatGPT4 that you want to use the data that you've uploaded to regenerate a similar figure. And if you just upload the data set and put that, that um, figure in there, it will go ahead and then it will then make a nice box plot like the one here, which is correctly labeled. And I haven't had to edit that at all. I've just fed in this image, asked it to do a similar figure with the data set I've uploaded and it's produced this really nice side-by-side -side box plot here. Okay, so that's the end of my part of the presentation. So if there are any quick questions, ask them now or else I'll hand over to Brad. Hi, Marika, it's Andrew here. So Hi, I guess Andrew. probably just uh, thanks for that. That's really interesting and slightly scary, um, but cool nonetheless. So uh, just to clarify this stage, um, uh, at the moment, we still can't use any human-related data at this point, so including de-identified data. Yeah, at this point, we're certain I mean, it's only been out since the end of July, Andrew, and certainly the advice I'm getting from UOW is that they do not want us update out, uploading our real data, even if it's de-identified at this stage. So um, the options are, as I said, to find a similar data set that's publicly available and then develop all the code on it and output it. But I don't imagine it'll be long before we have access to that capacity. Okay, that's yes, great. That's Thank the you. That's the way it is at the moment. Okay, all right, Brad. I might hand over to you in the interest of time, and we'll save questions till the end. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Marika. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen, and I'm hoping I'm sharing the right screen. Yes. Um, all right, cool. So I'm just going to have a little short section now where I talk a little bit about how we would use ChatGPT 3.5, so the older version of ChatGPT, um, in order to, but also the free version of ChatGPT, in order to help build up some of our scripts in R. Because as Marika pointed to, we don't have really the ability for us to upload our data set if it does contain confidential or private information um, or personal information. And so, what would be maybe a better approach is to use ChatGPT as a as a tool to help us actually curate and write our scripts. And you don't have to be a big programmer in order to use it. And that's the big game changer here. It might be a you know a learning tool that you can use to help improve your own coding capacity, um, and also allows you to you know move more and more into um, complicated analysis with a you know a little assistant helping you along the way. So I'm going to talk about the same data set that Marika talks about. Um, we've got our Pima Indians diabetes data set. I've got a bit of a summary of the variables that we were looking at. Um, and essentially what we were looking at is predicting or modeling what, what factors affect people's odds of having diabetes in this data set. Now, I've put these as additional variables just because I wanted to simplify this down a little bit. 
And I thought, you know, four variables is enough to look at at a time. But of course, all three of these would be feasible to include in our model. Um, and so essentially, we have to come up with a plan for the analysis. And you can ask ChatGPT uh, to help you come up with this plan. Um, or if you're someone who kind of knows roughly what analysis needs to take place, you can come up with it yourself and then use ChatGPT to guide you through the process. So um, the process of analysis we're going to be looking at, we're first going to just get our data set into R and R Studio. We're going to visualize our, the distribution of our continuous variables. Um, we're going to obtain some summary statistics, uh, perform a logistic regression, and of course, get the results from that logistic regression. So a pretty standard analysis where we do our EDA. And as Marika says, that is so, so critical to visualize and explore your data first, get a few um, interesting properties out to describe our data, and then we can do our more formal inferential analysis with the logistic regression. So the first step, um, we can open up, and I've got it live too, so I'm going to open it up to my chat GPT. Um, and what I'm also going to do is I'm going to have my R Studio open. And you can see what all I've done is copied and pasted the code directly from chat GPT into R and R Studio. Now, I did this beforehand just in case my computer crashes. As you know, we've, I've already had issues getting on today, so I'm glad I did do that. All right, so um, we've got... Uh, the first thing it, we need to do is actually load in our data set. Now, ChatGPT doesn't know your computer. It doesn't know what the directory is, where you store your files, what your username is. And so in order to kind of overcome that, it gives you a little bit of a warning down here, right? It says, make sure to replace this with the actual file path to diabetes.csv. But this is all I've told it, right? I will only give it one sentence of prompt, not a, not a lot of details. And... If I was to, you know, replace this with my actual pathway, which I can do here, and then run the code, I've got my diabetes data loaded in no problems. It was able to work out that code. It's not particularly complicated code, but it was able to do it. The next thing I want to do is visualize my distribution of the variables and so I asked, write code that allows me to visualize the distribution of the variables of my data set for each case of diabetes. Now, I didn't tell it what, what visualizations to come up with. I just asked ChatGPT to do it for me. And the first thing it's done is it's got a little bit of an if statement here to load the library or install the packages if we need it, um, which if you're new to R, this might look like a whole lot of gobbledygook, but needs to essentially happen before you can ever first start using ggplot2. Um, now, this code here is pretty complicated, and I'm going to run it just to show you that it does work, right? Just to show you that when it's finished, of course, when it's finished running, it does actually work. And now my R is crashing. Give me one second. Okay, you can believe me that it does work. Um, I'm just going to reload my R Studio and hope it comes up again. Come on. Just saying that you never work with animals or live coding. Um, uh, it always uh, happens. That's why I tried not to do the chat GPT for life. It's I know. Well, I, I didn't. I, I've got screenshots of all the chat GPT in case that crashed, but not of my R Studio. So I, I was confident that this R Studio would work, but that's okay. Um, I've got it back up now. Let me reshare. And if I load this and load up my plots, I'm going to take it one step at a time rather than trying to load it all at once. It's going to come up with various graphs related to my, my variables of interest. 
Now, if I actually looked at this code and looked at it in a little bit of detail, I noticed that it's done this step here, which if I was delete it, to delete it from my code and then run again, it actually doesn't change anything. So it's added in some kind of extra steps that aren't actually needed and never actually called. Um, which is part of that, you know, hallucinations that we see. Luckily, it, it didn't affect um, it didn't affect anything that's happened here um, because this was able to run. But if I actually looked at these data sets, there's nothing in them because it's made a fundamental error. And that is, it is assumed that I've coded my diabetes variable one and zero. And we're going to see this pop up again and again. But I thought, you know, most of the time it chat GPT isn't going to know how I've coded my variables and I've actually coded it. No diabetes has diabetes. So luckily this didn't make a difference in this analysis to get these plots, but for other analyses, it might make a difference. Um, and the other thing I will point out is, you know, it's created these bar graphs for categorical variables, but there's no categorical variables in the ones that I'm interested in. So essentially it's not, it's not going to, it, it, it's done a very general approach without specifying uniquely for my data set. And of course, it's quite difficult to interpret all this code. Now, if I was to give it a bit more of a specific command, and I say, obtain a histogram and box plot for the glute column in R, separated into cases of diabetes. Now this is hopefully going to do this job a bit better. And we can see that, yes, it has done it, and it's done it in a way that's a little bit more easy to interpret without those kind of risks of um, hallucini hallucinations going through my code. So being very specific and telling ChatGPT exactly what I want, I was able to get better outcome, less complicated. Of course, if you're new to this and you didn't know you needed a histogram and a box slot, maybe you wouldn't know to do it, but you could, of course, ask ChatGPT. Now, I'm actually someone who doesn't particularly like our dodged histograms, and I would prefer to have them as faceted, but, you know, I'm not actually writing this code, so I guess I can't, um, I can't complain too much. And if I want to do it for my other variables, I can just say repeat above for the BMI variable and the skin variable and whatever variables I want to look at it, and it will do it. All right, that's my that's my visualizations. What about descriptive statistics? Can I get some descriptive statistics out? Well, um, I'm going to ask it to create a table of descriptive statistics. I'm going to be specific about what descriptive statistics I want. I want the number of non-missing observations. I want the means, and I want the standard deviations of the BMI, glute, skin, and age variables. And I want that separated into the cases of diabetes. So let's see if it can do it. Well, first thing we're going to do is run this initial code that it might, needs me to run. But I run the first step, and if I check, it hasn't worked. And it hasn't worked because, again, it's assumed I've coded this diabetes as being zero. You might think that's an easy fix. Let's fix it up. Does it work now? Yeah, it does. It does work. It's not the nicest table, but it does work. Let's have a look at this one. Change this to has diabetes. See if it works. Yes, it does. And I can print my table like this, the diabetic versus non-diabetic. Now, unfortunately, this isn't the most um, simple way of doing it. In fact, if I was to just take this code and instead of putting a filter argument here, put a group by argument, it would have done it for me straight away. So it might have given me code that with a little bit of fixing up works out well. It's not necessarily the most efficient way of writing your code. And in fact, I've got the way I would have written it down here. You can see it's pretty straightforward and gives me a nice looking table that's pretty easy to interpret. So it might not be the best way of writing code, but it will get the job done. All right, 
let's have a look at our logistic regression model. Okay, I'm going to ask her to fit a logistic regression model on our modeling diabetes with respect to the variables glucose, BMI, skin, and age. I've it says yes, no worries. I can send you out the code. I've copied and pasted it in here and I run it and I'm getting an error. Now, this is probably the biggest problem with just using ChatGPT. Um, and that is a lot of these kind of more complicated functions, and GLM is not too complicated a function, but it is more complicated a function, requires restrictions on what type of variables I can fit into my, my, uh, into my code. And so this is where that little bit of coding experience has to come in. And for me, I recognize that my Y values must be between zero and one. Well, right now, if I look at my Y values, Oh, what's it called? Diabetes data. They're characters. They're not zeros and ones. So in order to get this right, I'll have to first convert this to zero and one. And in order to do that, I also have to specify in what order I want it to be. And now it runs. So this extra step, I have to include. But once I do that, no problems. It's able to run without issue. My last step is to obtain regression coefficients, um, my estimates. Basically, I want to extract this table here. And I've asked ChatGPT how to do it. And it, in the first time I run, I actually did this twice. The first time I did it, it told me to do run this long bit of code. And I did that and I got out this, an error, it doesn't work. Um, but I said, okay, maybe, maybe there was a problem. Let's just regenerate. And when I did that, it recognized that actually I can get exactly what I want with one command. Now, if I run it, it gives me what I want. So, there is a little bit of a lack of a draw here. Um, maybe generating multiple instances and trying it out multiple times to see which code actually works is the best way about doing this. Because um, as you can see, we've got a very simple line of code here that does what this code here is all trying to do. All righty. Now that was a lot of work to perform that analysis, particularly in comparison to chat, chat GPT-4. So is there a way that we could do this analysis a bit better and try to avoid as many of the issues we stumbled upon? Well, the way we can do it is by actually prompting it better. Okay, so instead of just asking things as I want it, I'm gonna tell chat GPT a little bit about my data set first in order to get it to work a little bit better. And that way, essentially what I'm doing is prompting it to be able to use the information within the code construction and avoid that general, um, you know, that really hyper-generalized code writing style that ChatGPT is doing. When I do that, we get code that is a lot simpler. I've got my step one here. I've got my, my step two, my histograms here for the exact variables I want. I've got my box plots here, the exact variables I want. Look at this code, summary table. Gives me exactly what I need in one line of code straight away without needing too much uh, effort. And the only issue is we again, have assumed the zero one codings. So if I'm going to copy and paste this and run all this code here, the only issue we're going to stumble across is the same issue we had before, which is that when I fed it into G, uh, GLM, okay, it's, it's erroring out on me. Um, this diabetes variable isn't working. And so if I just add this little bit of fix that I worked out here. Oh, 
I'll now have a code that works, no problems. Um, but unfortunately, my session is stuffing up again. Alrighty, so my, my key ta takeaways here are that by better initializing ChatGPT 3.5, we can get simpler and better out. Um, we no longer have to, has to write code. If we do that, ChatGPT no longer has to write code that is completely generic and hard to understand, um, but instead can actually give you simpler, specific code that's easy to customize. It will also give you consistent code practice throughout because as you can see, in my R scripts before, it was switching between tidyverse and base R almost interchangeably just based on the luck of the draw. So I've got consistent code practice throughout, um, although we still have to wash out for a couple of issues left in our code. All righty. Um, that's, that's all I wanted to say on that. Are there any, any questions or... Um, Brad, maybe just talk do the last couple of slides and then we'll get questions because we've only got a few minutes. Yep, yep, no worries. Yeah. All right, so um, just while while we have you here, I just wanted to point out a couple of things from the Statistical Consulting Centre. So that's me and Marika. Um, and we're a centre here that anyone can reach out to, any academic or PhD student or master's student, any researcher can reach out to and request an appointment with us, we can go through some of this analysis. So if you want to try out some chat GPT code, um, learn how to write R, or just need to talk about your specific project, you can go to our website and make an appointment. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we're starting up a data science and statistics community of practice. Now, this is essentially an online space and community that will allow us to share and um, uh, share information about statistics, um, access resources. So I'll be putting on resources up there. And as people suggest that we can update it, um, also allows you to collaborate with others. So if you have any questions or if you want have interesting observations in the statistics and data science space, I'm going to put that link in the chat now as well. So people can, can check out our, our page um, and join the group. Um, it also gives you access to the data science and stats support. So we have all the links there to be able to have a look at or uh, book an appointment or have a look at some of the online resources. And the other thing is that, that we will regularly put up um, information about when we're running training and seminars and workshops. Um, the full calendar will be up there so you can have a look at what uh, what things we're, uh, we're organizing. And this is aimed for uh, particularly HDR students, but all academics are welcome to join if they want to join. Um, you can participate, you know, we can get a, a good online community happening um, where we, you know, talk stats, talk data science and, and keep each other updated with what's happening. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is just very quickly, we're running a visualization, data visualization workshop in October. Um, it's running, it's an on, completely online workshop split over two days from 9.30 to 12.30 p.m. Um, we're running two streams. So if you want to learn how to create the graphs and figures in SPSS using Chart Builder or the customs tables um, and all those kind of which visualizations work best, we'll cover all that so you can do it in SPSS. Or if you want to learn a bit about how to do things in R and R Studio, we're also going to be covering it in that stream. We're going to go through ggplot2 and have a look at some of the visualizations we looked at in the the talk today. So um, two streams, depending on which software you use, we're not going to assume any kind of vast knowledge from either softwares, um, and it's a great way to basically broaden the, your your own capacity to make some really cool. Um, and some really important visualizations that you might need to make in order to get published. Cool. Okay. Great, thanks, Brad. Okay, so we've got a few minutes left. Um, any questions or feedback on that presentation? Anyone keen to give ChatGPT 3.5 or 4 a go? Anyone think they might use it? Okay, all right. Okay, well, Brad and I will hang on a little bit longer if anyone has questions. Otherwise, we'll give you three minutes to get a coffee or tea before you've got to get to your next one.
Great. Hi, Thanks Marika. for joining us. Hi, Karen. Hello. Hi. Thank you for your presentations today, both of you. I was just wondering, how do you deal with the problems of hallucinations? Because I've sort of bumped into that a few times as well. Like, do we have any guidelines or strategies or anything at UAW that can help us try and address that issue? No, look, I, well, I think it's a really tricky one because in my experience, they've been really subtle and you've had to know what you're doing to be able to pick them up. Like the one I had yesterday that was telling me those exact distributions that we were looking at today were not normally distributed when they clearly were you kind of have to know, have that level of information. Um, and the other one that I've come across is um, because the diabetes data set is very famous when I work with it and I do something that's non-standard, it's making an assumption from the LM LLM that I'm doing what everyone else is doing and it's giving me the wrong answer. And the only reason I knew that was because I knew what the actual answer was. So no, I think that's one of the real issues with hallucinations is that unless you have the knowledge to know that they're wrong or they're really obvious, I think I get my my first thought would be just to make sure you regenerate it a few times to because often if it does it once, it doesn't do it again. And also starting afresh, I find that when you've had chat GPT running for quite a while in a long session, it starts to sort of fragment and break up a bit more. So I would always come back and do things more than once. I think that's the only way. Um, and then it's unlikely to regenerate the same hallucination over and over again, basically. That would be my only advice. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, and Thomas, thanks for your comment about sessions. We have regular sessions that we advertise. Um, they're not necessarily monthly. They're more likely six to eight weeks. Uh, but if there's any suggestions for topics, that would be great. Um, we're always looking for things that people are interested in knowing about. Any other questions? Thanks for the comments about saying it's mind-blowing because I actually find that it's mind-blowing too. And as I said, I think this is just the start. And I think from here on in, um, the capacity and the ability to use this to make our lives easier as a tool is um, really important. And I also think after Brad's brilliant prompt there, he should be looking for one of those $330,000 jobs as three K jobs as a prompt engineer. So it's a really good skill to have. That's the other thing I'd say with hallucinations is that the prompt engineering is really the key to making the most of using chat GPT. Um, you've got to ask the right questions and you've got to fine tune those questions. And it is good to check that chat GPT is understood what you think that you've told it to do as well. So that would probably be my final feedback. So I think it's 12.30 now. So unless anyone has any burning questions, we'll um, end it there. Great. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining us and stay tuned for our next um, seminar. Thanks. Okay, Thank bye you. everyone.